you ever struggle taking photographs in dark situations? Well, there's a reason for that. It's because it really is the most difficult type of photography. And we photographers, we call this low light photography. Low light photography is a lot of fun, but it does take a little bit of time and experience to become really good at it. You're also going to need a lot of a little bit better equipment, or you're going to need to find ways to adjust to, equi to the equipment that you have at your disposal. So in this lesson, we're going to talk a little bit about some of those different things. We're going to talk about the equipment you need. We're going to talk about some of the techniques you're going to use for holding your camera that are going to be important. I'm going to give you a few tips for it, and I'm also going give, to give you a few examples of what low light photography is capable of. So how about we talk about that? How about we talk about what you need to know to be a good low light photographer. First of all, low light photography is going to be encountered in lots of places and mostly it's just um, going to be a question of darkness. And so you're going to, after sunset, it's going to be dark. Or even at sunset, you're going to have like, after the golden hour, you're going to have some, a lot of dark. You're going to have concerts and things like that. So I'm trying to spell it in German. I'm so sorry. Concerts. And you're going to have um, dark rooms or dark houses. So a lot of dark places, even like in the woods or something like that. Then just um, dark landscapes also. You're going to have uh, lots of, when you're outside doing um, maybe big trips in the woods or things like that, or if you're out in the city at night, you're going to find lots of dark places. And that's um, all of that in j basically would involve, if you want to take a photograph of it, being a little bit capable at low light photography. All right, so what are some of the challenges then? What does it, all of this mean in terms of um, what's, you know, settings and things like that that you need to think about for your computer or for your camera? Well, you're first of all going to have a lot of trouble freezing motion is going to be a problem. And freezing motion just means having a high enough shutter speed to freeze any action that happens in the photograph. And that is just really hard when you don't have a whole lot of light available. You're going to have color problems. Color is really hard to capture for certain cameras in low lighting situations. Metering is going to be hard, so you're going to have a little bit of difficulty figuring out what is 18% gray, like in our metering lesson. And camera shake is going to be a huge problem. So camera shake, because your shutter speeds are going to be low. Now what does that mean? What does a low shutter speed mean? Well, if you're out there shooting, let's do a little bit of math. We'll, we'll determine sort of what a low shutter speed means. When you've set up your camera, and you've got your ISO and your aperture set. So say we're at ISO 400, or actually erase that, let's do 800. So it's kind of a darker evening, it's 800 ISO. You've opened up your lens as open as it will get, so maybe we have a 3.5 um, f stopped lens. Well then, you have to take a look at this moment at your, l at your lens and see what, um, what zoom factor you're at. So say you're, you've got a 35 millimeter lens on your camera. Now that is the equivalent if you're on a digital camera, it's not, not equivalent, say you're, it is a digital camera with a 1.5 crop um, factor. So it's equivalent to a 50 millimeter lens. So if you don't know what I mean by that, it's basically that if you've got a digital camera with a DX, um, with a DX sensor, it crops the photo. So and a 35 millimeter lens actually creates an image that is a 50 millimeter image, essentially. So like it would be a 50 mill millimeter image on a film camera, but not on the digital camera that you have. Well, basically what you do with this number then, you've got this 50 millimeters, and now you just have to do a little bit of math. All you have to do is put one zero over top of that 50, and this right here, the result, is your slowest shutter speed that you should be using for handheld. Now, if you've got vibration reduction or things like that, so that you'll see things called VR lenses or you'll find things that are um, stabilizers, things like that, you might be able to go up one stop. So one stop in this situation would be one one hundredth of a stop or one one hundredth of a second. So you might be able to get away with that with a VR lens. So this is your slow shutter speed. Once you get below this, once you get below your handheld speed, is when you're really hitting, um, when you're really hitting your your slow shutter speed area for your camera, and that's when you want to start thinking about special techniques for holding the camera, where to set it, if you need a tripod, things like that. So along those lines, uh, equipment. Let's maybe talk a little bit about equipment over here in the bottom left. It's things that might help you. A tripod might be a good idea. Now, if you don't have a tripod or you can't afford a tripod, just find places where you can put your camera, things that you can, where places, things you can set your camera on or brace it against. So you could, for example, brace your camera up against a telephone pole and hold it very steadily and maybe even wedge a finger in between the, the camera and the pole as sort of a stabilizer and push the button. But you're trying to reduce this camera shake. That's, how, that's why you've got the tripod. You want to cut down on your camera shake. You could also think about a flashlight. It would be a good idea. I find flashlights are great for 
lots of things, for example, for um, working with the camera. Sometimes you have buttons you might not know where they're at. And it's also good for setting up and even for light painting. We'll talk about light painting a little bit towards the end of the lesson. Also, if you have an SLR, you want a fast lens, but you don't necessarily need one. Uh, just an idea. You could also have a strobe or a sometimes what's called a flash in sort of common, uh, common English. A strobe is just uh, the, the thing that's on the top of your camera, but maybe you have a separate one that you can use, and I'll show you some uses for that. Another thing you could try is having a cable release. I'm not going to write it down because it's really a little bit extra, and most people don't really need it. All right, so that is kind of an introduction to some of the concepts here, some of the things that you might need to know, and some of the things that I might mention here in this lesson. All right, so let's just take a couple example images here. We're going to start out back in Montana, where I come from, and I took this hike with my friend Christopher. And Chris is sitting here next to the fire, and I am at ISO 400. I'm at F5. I'm at a 15th of a second. Now, just a little bit later, this is just really just after sunset, so right here, the sun's setting, and right here over on the right, um, the sun has already set. And still, we're at 400, and still we are at F5. But now, we are at 10 seconds. So that is a huge difference. That is multiple times uh, longer. This right here is your low shutter speed situation. And I did this with a tripod. Don't necessarily need to. I could have set it on a rock. I could have put it on my camera bag, whatever was high enough to get the image that I wanted. But you can see here that um, Chris didn't move during the image it's during while I was taking the photograph. And luckily, he was just tranced out staring into the fire, and I just took a photo while he was doing that. Um, I didn't have to ask him to do that or anything like that. But if he were to move, the photo would be um, sort of different. It would be very, it might have, I would say, ruined, but not necessarily. But you can see here, because it, the, the exposure is so long, you can see the sparks coming up off the fire. You can see the glow of the fire everywhere, the glow of the sky, the beautiful Montana sky back there. You can really kind of see everything, and you can see also the difference here between these two photographs. I would say both of them are low light photographs, but this one over here to the right is much lower and definitely is a little bit harder of an image to get. You can get this image to the right with just about any camera, um, even a really inexpensive camera, but it really is going to push the limits of your camera. We should talk a little bit maybe about that as we're rolling through here. Um, really good com cameras have uh, have a, re a much better sensor in terms of its capture ability to capture low light. That's really what makes a sensor really a quality sensor. And so when they put a, a sensor in a really cheap camera or in a cell phone, it's often just a sensor that is pretty light sensitive but not very. And when you turn up the power on that sensor and as you get up towards the higher ISO ranges, that's where you really start seeing sort of the quality fall off and that's where um, the images start to kind of become a little bit less pretty. Now, let's move on here and start talking about these less, these images that I've pulled up. They're both not necessarily really low light photography, but they're they're pretty much right on the edge. It's kind of the boundary of low light photography. And right here, I think I was shooting I was shooting at about a 500th um, ISO, a 500 ISO, which is a step step between traditional ISOs that are, you'll find on some professional cameras. I was shooting at f 1.8, and I think my shutter speed was around I think it was around a, fi a 50th or so. Um, and this is just an example of sort of the moodiness that I love about about low light photography. It's great. And this image over here to um, to the left is actually taken with the same uh, the same uh, f stop and the same shutter speed, but it was taken at an 800, an 800 ISO, so a little bit lower. And um, this is one of the things about having a better camera. This is the this is the these photos were taken both with my with my nicer professional camera. And you can just kind of see the difference in the quality of an 800 ISO on a better on a better camera. The colors are accurate, and the contrast is good. And I'm also using a really nice lens, which helps a little bit. And over here, I was using the same camera and got really nice results, um, just because I was also able to hold my camera very carefully. Now that's that's another point. If you really want to get good photographs here, you're going to really want to make sure that you're holding your camera right. So you're going to want to go back and take a look at our lesson about how to hold your camera. That will really give you some good tips. One of the things about low light photography is that you get a lot of this kind of stuff right here. This is the trouble capturing motion that I was talking about right here. And even here on this image, if you look up close on Dev's hand, you can see that his hand is moving and it's hard to capture motion in low light situations. So um, you can see here, I took many versions of this photograph to the left here and I ended up going with the one where he was moving the least because otherwise the image was just a little bit too blurred to really 
to really match the feeling that I kind of want for it. So that's one thing to watch. You also want to watch the noise. If you look closely at these images, you can see what's called digital noise or grain um, if, you're, if you're working with a film camera. And it's not very extreme on these examples because the light is still there, but um, you're going to notice a definite drop in quality as your ISO goes up. You can learn more about that in our ISO uh, lesson. So let's move on here a little bit. Again, I was talking about getting close to light sources. That is always a good thing to do. Try to find a nice angle to your light source and just stay close to it. Get try to get some try to get some different angles without burning yourself. I think I almost actually caught my sleeve on fire taking the photo to the right here. And to the left, you can see I just caught there was a light coming down, beaming through this wine glass, and it made this cool reflection on the table. Kind of um, I don't know if you call it a reflection, but whatever um, sort of went through and made this pattern on the table and I uh, I got up close on that and because it's a really bright thing I could underexpose everything else and uh, and just concentrate on that piece of light and that's another thing you're gonna have to really watch your exposure in these sort of situations and I would say if you're in doubt I would underexpose and underexposing is good for digital cameras because you really kind of can pull a lot of the information back out. If you're using a film camera, you can't really get rid of it all. So you want to try not to you want to try not to underexpose as much as you can. But um, but underexposure is okay for digital in a lot of ways. So you can always try that. You can also I would recommend um, getting some friends to join up and maybe even trying out some light painting. Light painting is a lot of fun, and you can do it with lots of different things. You can use a strobe, like I mentioned before at the beginning. You can use a flashlight, so here up to the right we've used a strobe. And to the left we're using a frisbee, It's like a, um, but you can just exchange it for an LED light or a flashlight or whatever. Um, and basically all we did for these images, this one for example to the, to the left here, is a, it's just a 30 second exposure. And we just had um, the people in the group write the word PhotoCamp. This was a PhotoCamp that I was leading last year, or two years ago now. And um, we just had them write it with their hands, and then they threw the, <laughs> they threw the, uh, the Frisbee away. It, was, it had an LED light on it. And in that time that that light passed across through all their hands, you can see that they're standing there. They stood standing, and, they, and the, the sensor captured the light as that Frisbee moved along the path. Um, of the words photo camp. And so you can do this with lots of other different types of light source. I'll show you another example here in a second. And this one to the right, you can see that we just had someone, you can see the person actually standing here, fire a strobe at our friends while they were jumping up in the air. And this was actually probably like a, I think it was maybe like a 10 second exposure or so. Uh, but it doesn't matter because just that one moment where the flash hit them is when you actually see our friends there. All right, so that is uh, a little bit of a roundup of what you can do with low light photography. Remember that bad weather and cloudy days and dark um, music clubs are, can be your best friend as a photographer, so you want to go out and do the best you can with what equipment you've got. Alright, you can come back and check out more lessons at allversity.org.